All right. Today, our main focus is on the presidential election. We talked about elections yesterday, but presidential elections are our main focus today. Presidential elections are affected by a myriad of factors, but one of the most important ones is the incumbency attack. Incumbents are candidates, or in this case, presidential candidates seeking re-election. Candidates that already hold the office and they're trying to get re-elected for a second term. In the United States, as we observe the trend of history, incumbents or presidential incumbents usually win. More often than not, if a president is seeking re-election, he will probably win because he is given multiple advantages over his challenger. So what are those advantages? Number one, name recognition. He's been president for four years now, and people know him better, and voters tend to gravitate towards the candidates that are more familiar to them. Number two, they have experience. And for a lot of voters, that matters a lot. They have experience being president, working with Congress, passing budgets, passing the law, passing laws, um, working with other countries as our, as our chief diplomat. That matters for a lot of voters. Not only do they have experience being the president, they also have experience campaigning before. They've won before. Four years ago, they know what it takes to win. So that also matters. And lastly, they have something that the other candidate, the challenger, does not have. They have the president's holy pulpit, the attention given to the president by the public and by the media. Not only can it be used by the president to promote policies that he wants so that they're more likely to get passed, he can also use the bully pulpit to appeal to the American voter. He can also use the bully pulpit to campaign. When the president speaks, people listen, and this can be utilized by incumbents to appeal to American voters. That's why what happened to Donald Trump in 2020 is a rare occurrence. Usually, a president seeking re-election wins. Any questions so far? The first thing that you have to do if you plan to be the president of the United States is to first win your party's nomination. Your party's nomination. If you get your party's nomination, it means all the resources, all the money, all the time, all the organization of the party will be dedicated to getting you to win. But that's going to be very hard to do. So you need to win your party's nomination. If you don't have a D or an R next to your name, you will not become the President of the United States. So how do you become the Republican nominee or the Democratic nominee? The goal is win the majority, majority, make sure you remember what majority means, more than half, of the party delegates. Win the majority of the party delegates. Win the majority of the party delegates. More than half of the party delegates. How do you win these party delegates? You have to compete with other party members who also want the same thing, which is the nomination from your party in party elections that we call primaries and caucuses. So I'll give you an example of what this looks like. Depending on how big your party is, I'm sorry, your state is, you have a number of party delegates. So California is the biggest state in the union. They have 172 Republican delegates, right? You have to compete in every single state against other party members for these delegates. And if you win more than half of them, which Donald Trump did, 2016, there's about 2,500 delegates in the Republican Party. Donald Trump won about 1,500 of them, right? You will become the nominee. Joe Biden did the same thing for the Democratic Party in 2020. All right, so how do you get these delegates? You have to win party elections. There's two types of party elections. So you have to compete against party, fellow party members, right? Democrat versus Democrat and Republican versus Republican for these delegates. The goal is, you want to get the majority of these delegates. How do you win them? It depends. Some parties, their elections are known as primaries. Some parties use the caucus system. They're different. You need to know the difference between the two. A party primary is like a regular election. Voters are invited to show up. They vote in a closed ballot. Nobody knows who they're voting for. Only you're not voting for the actual office. You're voting for who you want your party to nominate. Right? That's the difference. And it's voting throughout the day. Voter turnout in primaries are typically higher than if a party conducts a caucus. So voter turnout is higher. You'll see why later on. A few states, though, like Iowa and, ha and Hawaii, they use the caucus system. The Republicans and Democrats use this archaic system called a caucus. In a caucus, it's more like a meeting. So party members will gather together in a public building like a church or school, a gymnasium. 
and they will arrange themselves physically according to the candidate that they support. So let's say I'm a Bernie Sanders supporter. I'm going to have to stand with my fellow Bernie Sanders supporter. People that supported um, Joe Biden are going to be on this side of the room. People that support Elizabeth Warren are going to be on this side of the room. And then for about three to four hours, they will debate each other, trying to convince supporters from one side to switch over. If I get convinced, let's say I started out as a Bernie Sanders supporter, but I get convinced, hey, Bert, Joe Biden might be a better nominee for our party, I have to physically move to that side of the room. At the end, you get to vote, but the voting is open so everybody knows who people voted for. All good so far? Why does this get such a lower voter turnout? Why not a lot of people show up when parties have a caucus instead of a primary? Because of time, it takes a lot of time. The time commitment is high. So voter turnout in these are usually fairly low. Only people that really, really care about their party participate in these. I encourage you guys to make sure that when these primaries and caucuses come about, in Texas we have primaries, right? If, even if you're a Republican or a Democrat, make sure you participate. Because in the real election, you might end up with crappy choice A and crappy choice B. If you want to have a voice on who your party will nominate, you need to participate in these. Another complication. Most states use primaries, but there are two types of primaries, closed and open ones. In a closed primary, only registered party members are allowed to participate. So if you want to participate in the Democratic primary, you need to be registered with a Democratic party. In states that have closed primaries, again, only registered party members are allowed to participate. Which means, if you're an independent, if you don't have a party officially, or you're a third party voter, you're not allowed to participate. You're not allowed to have a voice. Which is sad, because usually the real election is determined by independent voters. In an open primary, anybody's allowed to participate. You don't need to be registered to a specific party. What's weird is, in open primaries, independents can participate, but even voters from the opposite party are allowed to participate in a party that they do not belong in. So for example, if I was a Republican, sure, most of the time I probably would want to participate in the Republican primary, but I have a choice. I can instead participate in the Democratic party instead. Anybody know why I would do it? Sorry? Very good. So what a lot of um, voters do, let's say I'm a staunch Republican, right? Why would I ever vote in a Democratic prior, uh, primary? What they do is, they do this to vote for the weaker candidate, hoping that that weak candidate gets the nomination, so in the real election, their candidate wipes the floor with that candidate. Does that make sense? This is called party rating. Don't do this. You can do this in Texas because we do have an open primary, but try not. Vote in the party that you identify. You're only allowed to vote once you have to choose. Anybody have any questions? Now, these primaries and caucuses, anybody know in an election year, like in 2024, when's the real election? What month? November, very good. These primaries and caucuses that the parties are doing throughout the states are going to take place early, January to about June, so the early months of the calendar year, right? So that they can decide who the nominee is going to be before the election. Now, Early primaries and caucuses are very important because they're like your debut to the American public. Anybody know? Well, you probably don't know. The earliest caucus is Iowa, and the earliest primary is New Hampshire. That's why during election season you hear the phrases Iowa caucus and New Hampshire primary a lot because they're the earliest. They're very important, not because of the amount of delegates they have to offer. They don't have a lot of delegates to offer. They're not very big states. They're important because they're first. This is your debut to the American public as a candidate, which means if you do really well, even if you don't win, if you do really well, people are going to pay more attention to you. That's going to attract more voters to your side, more money will be donated to your campaign. That can mean very good things in the later states. But if you do bad, or you do worse than expected, you're going to lose support. You're going to lose money, and you may not be able to continue. You lose a lot of good candidates in the early contest. You may not know this, but in 2020, Beto O'Rourke uh, Beto O'Rourke ran. He wanted to become the Democratic nominee. The problem was, he did not do well in Iowa, he did not do well in New Hampshire. He lost support, he lost money, he couldn't continue. Does that make sense for everybody? To, get, to tell you how important this is, no Republican has ever won the nomination without winning either Iowa or New Hampshire. They have to have win one. 
no one has ever gotten the nomination without one or the other. Any questions? All right. Then, in that summer, after all the caucuses and primaries are done, each party will hold what we call a party convention, the National Party Convention, where all the delegates will meet and they will cast the vote to for the candidates that their states chose. Whose national convention is this shown in the picture? The Republican one or the Democratic one? It's a Republican. It's like a big pep rally for the party. It's like a week long. They invite celebrity guests, singers, celebrities, right? At the end, the delegates vote for the candidates, and whoever gets the majority, more than half of those delegates, they will become the nominee of their party. So delegates gather, and they cast their votes for the candidates. Nominees for president and vice president are officially announced are officially announced. If we have time, I'll show you what, what a convention looks like. All right. Now that you've become the nominee of your party, is the work done? No. Ask Hillary Clinton if the work is done, right? Just because you've become the nominee of your party, it still means you need to beat the other party's nominee in the real election. So after the convention, you're going to be busy until November campaigning against the other party's nominee. All right. Now, I want to take a break here to talk about state elections. A lot of people don't care about their state governments. A lot of people don't care about who represents them in, in the Texas legislature, in the Texas Senate, and the Texas House of Representatives in Austin. But even if you don't care about your state government, you should know that whoever's in charge of the state government has a big impact on national elections, including the presidential election. Because yesterday we talked about voting requirements and election requirements are decided at which level, national or state? State level. Your state governments can make it harder for people to vote, and they can make it easier for people to vote, right? With laws, with procedures like photo ID laws, and not allowing prisoners to vote, lengthening or shortening early, early voting time, those have an impact. What's the, the rule of thumb is, the more people that vote, if your state makes it easy for people to vote, right? That's good for which candidate, the Democratic one or the Republican one? Usually it's good for the Democratic candidate. The more people that show up, like in 2020, uh, 20, a lot of people showed up, like 70% of eligible voters. That's good for the Democratic candidates. If your state is very strict with its election laws, right, that's usually good for the Republican candidates. But usually the people that get discouraged by state election laws that are very strict are minorities, college students. Those people usually vote what? Democrat. That makes sense for everybody. So it's also important who your state government representatives are going to because they decide how hard it is or how easy it is to vote in the state. Moving on, today we're going to talk about how do you actually become the President of the United States. In other words, we're going to talk about the electoral college system that our founding fathers created. This is an Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution. If you want to know how this works, you read Article 2. The same article where they talk about the presidency, they also talk about how to select them. This is not how it works. Right? In other countries, people show up, they vote, whoever gets the most votes, they become the President. That's not how it works in the United States. So that's sort of when you guys cast your vote for a candidate, whether it's Trump or whoever it is that you're going to vote for, you're not directly giving him your vote. That's not how it works in the United States. Instead, you are suggesting to the electors of your state who to vote for. Because the people that actually select who the next president is going to be are not the American people directly, but the electors that represent them. The electors that represent them. Why? to keep power to choose the president out of the direct control of the people. They did not want like a charismatic candidate being able to get away with his good looks and good personality and become the president of the United States, right? They wanted to put a middleman. The electoral college is supposed to be there to make sure that we don't select somebody who's wrong for the country. That if, even if we did, they can turn around and select somebody else. Anybody can answer that question for me? Which model of democracy is this? Yeah. The democracy. All right, let's talk about how it works. Each state is given a number of electors or a number of electoral votes. Those electoral votes can be easily calculated. Here's how you calculate them. It is the amount of representatives you have in Congress, in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. So, let's add it up. This number right here, the number of US House members you have, what does that depend on? Because of the Great Compromise, that depends on what? Population. That depends on in the recent census, because our, our population grew by a lot. Today, 
Texas has 38 members in the House of Representatives, 38. And then you add the number of senators. That number is always constant. What number? Two, because every state has two. So how many electoral votes do we have in Texas? 40. In 2024, in Texas, the state of Texas has 40 electoral votes to offer the candidates. No good so far. So largely, the number of electoral votes the state has depends on population. The bigger state is, the more electors, electoral votes you have. Which means, who has the most electoral votes to offer? California. All right, how do you become president? You need to win the majority of electoral votes. You need to win the majority of electoral What does majority mean again? Not just the most, but what? More than half. You need more than half of the electoral votes. Today, anybody know what that magic number is? What is the majority of electoral votes? That magic number today is 270 electoral votes. 270. Once a candidate crosses that threshold, it doesn't matter what the outcome of the other elections are. He is now the president of the United States. In 2016, Donald Trump got 306, well above that 270 that he needed, so he became the next president of the United States. If you were following the election in 2020, CNN, Fox News announced Joe Biden was our next president even before some states were done counting their ballots. Can you tell me why? Because he already passed the 270. It doesn't matter if Donald Trump wins those other states, right? He's not going to have enough to get the majority of the electoral votes. He's already beat it. That makes sense for everybody. That's the goal. 270, more than half of the electoral votes. Once you get that, you're now the next president of the United States. The question is, how do you get that? Most states give their electors, they award their electors using, using winner takes all. They award all of their electoral votes to the winner of their state, whoever gets the most votes in their state. Whoever gets the most votes in their state. 40 out of the 50 states, this is what the system that they use. Whoever gets the most votes, even if by just one vote, they award all of the electoral votes to that candidate. The only states that don't do this is Nebraska and Maine. But the rest of the country, winner takes all, is what they use. So, I'll show you how this works. Let's make a hypothetical country. This is the state of Kauai. The state of Kauai has 10 electoral votes to offer. Right? Here's what it means. That means there are 10 electors pledged to vote for Donald Trump, and there are 10 electors pledged to vote for Joe Biden. When you show up in the state of Kauai to cast a vote, you're not really giving your vote to Joe Biden or to Donald Trump. What you're doing is you're telling your state, if you voted for Donald Trump, hey, I want these guys, these electors, to be sent to the Electoral College so that they can vote for who? Donald Trump. If you vote for Joe Biden, you're telling your state, hey, I want these 10 electors to go to the, to the Electoral College so that they can cast their vote for Joe Biden. I want these guys to stay home. That's what you're doing. You're not voting for the actual candidate, you're voting for a slate of electors. That all good? Now, depending on who wins the state, all of the electors will be from that candidate. So who won in the state of Kauai? Trump did. He got more votes than Joe Biden. So who gets to go to Electoral College? The red electors or the blue electors? The red electors will go to Electoral College with the understanding that they will cast their vote for Donald Trump. That's 10 more votes towards that 270 that he needs to be president of the United States. All good? All right, here's the thing, right? The margin of victory does not matter. In this case, Donald Trump wiped the floor with Joe Biden, right? But it doesn't have to be that much. It could be that he only won by a little bit. The outcome of the election could have been like this, but they're only separated by a few votes. But whose electors are gonna go to the electoral college? The red ones or the blue ones? The red ones are gonna go. What happens to these guys? How many total votes does Joe Biden get from this state? Even though almost half of the state voted for Joe Biden, that translated to no electoral votes in the end. Does that make sense? The winner takes all creates a lot of problems. The system creates a lot of problems. And I'll show you how. Nebraska and Maine are the only states that don't do this. They award their electoral votes per congressional district. Per congressional district. You can see this play out in Nebraska in 2008. Two of their electoral votes went the Republican way, and one of the districts voted for Obama instead. So they split up the electoral votes. But 
again, when it comes to Maine and Nebraska, they don't have a lot of electoral votes to offer, so they don't really matter that much. Most of the country uses the winner takes all system. Any questions so far? Somebody's not asking the real question here, and that is, what if no one gets the majority? What if no one crosses that 2070 that they need to become the next president of the United States? There was a point in time in 2020 where this was a realistic possibility. It was looking like it was going to be a tie. 269 for, a, for Trump and 269 for President Biden, right? If that happens, a procedure in the U.S. Constitution gets triggered. We take the top three vote-getters and we allow the House of Representatives to decide between the three. The House of Representatives will decide between the top three electoral vote-getters. Each state, right, no matter how many representatives they have, they can only cast one vote. So what does that mean? Texas has 40 members in the House of Representatives, but all those 40 representatives can only cast one vote. California has like 50-something representatives in the House, but they all have to cast one vote. Every state is going to be. Do they have to choose the guy who got the most votes? They can choose from any of them. And you'd be surprised how many times this has happened before. The first time it happened, those of you who are a fan of the Hamilton musical, is the election of 1800. In the election of 1800, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr tied in electoral votes. So the procedure got triggered. The House of Representatives decided between the three, the top three vote getters. And Hamilton used his influence in the House of Representatives to have his friends select Thomas Jefferson, making Aaron Burr angry for life. Sense so far? One of the most egregious examples of this is what happened in 1824. There are all the candidates in 1824. Look at who got the most votes, the most popular votes, most people to vote for him. Andrew Jackson got the most popular votes. He also got the most electoral votes out of all the candidates. The problem is, he did not get the majority. He did not get more than half. So the procedure gets triggered. Anybody know who won 1824? John Quincy Adams. It wasn't Jackson, it was John the House of Representatives did not choose the guy that got the most votes. They didn't even choose the guy that got the most electoral votes. They chose somebody else. Now, you have to decide for yourself, is this democracy? Is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Any questions? This will definitely be asked um, on your exam. So make sure you know about this. All right, so the impact of the electoral college, mostly the winner-takes-all system is the, the cause, the root cause of all these problems. Number one, if you're a candidate, you only have a certain amount of time to campaign. You only have a certain amount of money to campaign. Those resources are finite. Time and money are finite. So you have to focus your time and money in the states that matter. So which states are you going to focus in more? You know it's winner-takes-all, right? So even if you win by one vote, you get all of that state's electoral votes. So which states will matter more? bigger population, the larger states that can offer you a lot of electoral votes that can be added to your county. So candidates usually pay more attention to the larger states. However, not all large states matter. The winner takes all system also creates the problem of swing states versus safe states, battleground states versus safe states. A safe state is a state whose population overwhelmingly supports one party. A population a state whose population overwhelmingly supports one party. The difference between the number of Republicans and Democrats in that state is so significant that the outcome of the election is pretty much already decided. That it doesn't matter how much campaigning a candidate does in that state, the outcome is pretty much decided because of the math. So the winner is generally already decided. So you would think, Right? Because of the winner takes all system, you would think that California is the prize of the electoral college because it can offer the most electoral votes. But you would be wrong. California is largely ignored by presidential candidates. The reason why is the state, the number of Democrats versus the number of Republicans is so drastically different. Who has an advantage in California? Democrats. There are so much more Democratic liberals in California than there are Republican conservatives that we know who's gonna win California. Regardless of how much campaigning a candidate does, the Democrats will win California. 
Now make sense for everybody. Those 55 electoral votes, even before the 2020 election, we already knew where it's going to go. It's going to go to the Democratic candidate. Whoever the Democrats chose, it could have been Bernie Sanders, it could have been Joe Biden. It didn't matter. It won't go to the Democratic candidate because the math just doesn't add up for the Republicans. And don't feel too sad for the Republicans because they also have their version of state states. Which one's the biggest one? For the Republicans. Plus, the number of Republicans and Democrats in this state is so drastically different that we know that our electoral votes and probably our 40 electoral votes in 2024 are probably going to go to the Republican candidate. Does that make sense? If you're Joe Biden, would you campaign in California? No, because why? You already won. Why waste your time? Why waste your money? Focus it on states. Let that amount of effort can actually matter, can actually make a difference. If you're Donald Trump, would you campaign in California? Why not? You've already lost. No amount of money, no amount of time you can tour in California will make up that difference in numbers. Does that make sense? Unfortunately for the United States, almost all of the states are safe states. The only states that actually matter for candidates are what we call battleground states. Battleground states are states that could reasonably be won by any of, by both of the Democratic or the Republican candidates. Any of them could reasonably win it because the number of Republicans and Democrats are not so drastically different. So good campaigning can actually matter in battleground states. Money and effort can actually matter in battleground states. Does anybody know, when it comes to presidential elections, what state is the prize of the electoral college system? Which state is the biggest battleground or swing state? We call it swing states because they can swing either Republican or Democrat. Georgia's, Georgia is a weird case because it used to be solidly Republican, but nowadays it's become more of a battleground state. But it's not the biggest battleground state. Wait up. Florida. Very good. Florida. Back then it was 29. Nowadays I think they have 30 electoral votes now because the population grew by a lot. It's the prize of, although the last few elections they've gotten the Republican way to come. But they're usually the biggest battleground state. These states right here in the Midwest are also battleground states. And you can see this. It's two minutes into the 2024 election. When people are running for president, it's not like they're actually running for the entire country. They're running to be the president of Ohio, of Michigan, of Florida, because those are the only states that matter. Those are the states that actually determine the outcome of a presidential election. You live in a safe state. Your vote is not going to matter much. Any questions? All right, let's move on. So you get memes like this, right? Presidential election, more focused on battleground states than the rest of the country. This was a cartoon in an AP exam where the swing states and battleground states are exaggerated because that's the way the candidates see the states. This, some people tracked down the number of visits that the 2004 candidates for president made to these states. And look at where most of those visits were in the campaign. This is the amount of money they spend on TV ads. And Texas, for example, we didn't get a lot of visits. And we also didn't get a lot of money in, invested in TV advertising because they know we're going to go the Republican way. Anyone have any questions? end up winning, the person that gets the most votes in total, don't always end up becoming the president. Some countries, again, this is easy, they don't have an electoral college system to just count the number of votes, right? In Texas, in the United States, even if you get the most votes, it does not necessarily mean that you're going to win the presidency. The last time this happened was in 2016. Hillary Clinton got about 3 million more votes than Donald Trump, but did she become president? No, because it's not about that. That's not the name of the game. The name of the game for the electoral ballot is to win the key battleground states that you need, even by a little bit, to get over that 270, the majority of electoral votes. Doesn't matter how you get there, as long as you get there. Again, you have to ask yourself as you're growing up and you become adults, is this democracy? Is this the way it should be? Do you agree with our founding fathers that there needs to be somebody in the middle that stops us from making the wrong choice? Do we still need that nowadays? Questions. Another problem with that electoral college system. The example I gave you, right? Who won the state of Kauai? Trump. So which electors are we sending? Red or blue? 
red. So these red electors are pledged to vote for Donald Trump. So when they get to the electoral college, they're supposed to, on the rules, vote for Donald Trump. Here's the thing, right? Nothing in the Constitution stops them from voting for somebody else. They can disobey the will of their state and vote for somebody else because that's what our founding fathers intended, right? If the state chose the wrong guy, these electors can choose somebody else. That's the whole intention. So in most of the states, there isn't even a punishment for doing so. In Texas, if an elector that we chose goes to electoral college and vote for somebody else that we didn't like, nothing's going to happen. These are called faithless or Hamilton electors. Again, this is what our founding fathers intended. Right? So even though these guys are supposed to vote for Donald Trump, they don't have to. They can vote for somebody else. And in many states, they're not even punished for it. And those states that, get our pun uh, that punish their electors for voting for somebody else, the punishment comes afterwards. So they can still do it. They'll just get punished afterwards. In fact, this happened recently in the 2016 elections. We had 38 electors, right? These 38 people, because the Republican candidate won in 2016, these 38 people were pledged to vote for Donald Trump, the, the, the Republican candidate. But two of our electors decided to vote for somebody else. One of them voted for John Kasich, who wasn't even running anymore. Again, should this be allowed? Is this democracy? That's something you need to um, straggle with yourself. All right, another thing that's going to be on your exam, right? Because of the way the winner, the electoral college system plays out, right, and the number of electors each state has, some people's votes matter more than others. Let's compare the biggest state in the union and the smallest state in the union, California versus Wyoming. For every elector that California has, that represents about 700,000 Californians. Every elector that Wyoming has only represents about 200,000 Wyomings. Who's this, who's this unfair to? The bigger state or the smaller state? Who has more representation? The bigger or the smaller state? The smaller. This is unfair for the big state because their vote doesn't count as much. Because each elector represents so many people. Each elector in Wyoming only represents a few amount of people, while in California, they represent so many. So these people's votes don't have as much of an impact as a Wyoming's vote. Unfortunately for you, do you live in a large state or a small state? You live in a large state, so you are underrepresented in your own electoral college. Your vote doesn't count as much. So remember that, that's going to be on your exam. So larger states are underrepresented, while smaller states are overrepresented. Wyoming, uh, people from Wyoming have more of an impact than people from California or from Texas. All right, next. And this is probably one of the biggest problems in the global college system, right? In countries that have just the popular vote, every vote matters. Every single vote matters, right? It doesn't matter what state or province you're from, if every vote counts, if every vote determines the outcome of the election, then every single vote will matter. That's not the case in the United States, right? 2024, I know a lot of you are going to be excited to vote, right? Some of you in this class who are Democrats are going to wake up early morning and you're going to be excited over the prospect of being able to have a voice in the presidential election. You're going to cast your vote for the Democratic candidate. Well, too bad. It didn't matter. Our 40 electoral like, votes is going to go to the Republican candidate regardless of whether or not you woke up that morning, right? So there's a lot of people in the United States thinking, why should I even show up? Republicans in California are thinking the same thing. Why does it matter? My vote doesn't count, right? First of all, only the swing states matter. Only the battleground states matter. So if you live in a state state, it doesn't matter. Even if you live in a battleground state like Florida, if you end up voting for your state's losing party, what does your vote mean in terms of electoral votes? Nothing. Translated to zero. Right? This is the problem with the electoral college system. That some people's political efficacy, their belief that they can make a difference, right? They can they can impact the outcome gets lower. Uh, so the electoral college system may lower an individual's efficacy, especially if she lives in a safe state. Alright. Everything that I just told you is a lie. Even if you live in a safe state, participation matters. Look at the elections and the margin of victory between the Republicans and Democrats in the state of Texas. Yeah. What's happening to the margin of victory? Is it getting larger or smaller? It's 
getting narrower and narrower. This is why participation still matters. If you get it close, you get the Republican Party nervous, and you get the Democratic Party hopeful. If you want them to care about you, if you want them to care about your wants and needs and your interests, right? Even if your candidate doesn't win, you get it close. Republicans will get nervous, so they'll pay attention more. The Democrats will get hopeful, so they'll pay attention more to the wants and needs of our state. So even if your candidate's not going to win, it still matters. All right, next, let's talk about third-party candidates or independent kind of candidates. Third-party third candidates, because the winner-takes-all system are at a severe disadvantage. Because for a third-party candidate, to win electoral votes, how many of the candidates do they need to be in a state? They have to beat the Republican one, and they have to beat the Democrat. Even beating one is hard enough for a third party candidate, right? Because of all the disadvantages they have. They have to beat them. And if they don't, even if they get votes, what does that, what does that translate to in electoral votes? Zero. In 1992, a third party candidate did really, really well. But how many votes Ross Perot from a third party got? Eight million Americans voted for him. That translated about 10% of the American population. Right? A significant amount of votes. What did that translate to electoral like votes? Zero. Because he couldn't manage to beat both the Democrat and Republican in any of the state. He gets zero electoral like votes. So if you're a third party candidate, even if you get significant amount of support, you are at a severe disadvantage. Because you have to beat votes because of the winner takes all system. So, third party candidates are a severe disadvantage. Often do not win any electoral vote, even with substantial support. Even with substantial support. Alright, but here's the thing, right? I told you this before. Even though third party candidates don't always all win, win, often win, what can they do? side vote votes away from the major party candidates preventing one from winning. Remember, in 2016, the only reason, one of the only reasons why Hillary Clinton lost is that there were a lot of people that voted third party because they didn't like any of the candidates. In the Midwest, a lot of people voted third party. If even a fraction of those votes went to the Hillary Clinton side instead, she would have won the 2016 election. But because people voted third party, which is essentially, this is not factually true, but you're kind of wasting your vote because it's not really going to um, lead to the winner or the loser, right? But it's siphoning votes away from the major party candidates that actually have a chance. So make sure you remember that. That will be on your exam, too. There are advantages to the electoral college system. We'll talk about them tomorrow. But right now, I want you to look at your essay number four because it's all about this, right? And right now, try to come up with a thesis so that you don't have a lot of work to do tonight. It's online, right? I also gave you hard copies. If you need a hard copy, I'll give you one. Just let me know. We're done for today. We'll continue the rest tomorrow. Don't worry about the Ed Puzzle inside today. But if you owe me an Ed Puzzle, if you have a zero one.